Uh, my name is Scott McDougall, and I am Associate Professor of Theology here at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, California, and I am also a, a member of the core doctoral faculty at the Graduate Theological Union, which is also in Berkeley, California. CDSP is a member institution of that consortium. And I've been asked to speak a little bit on philosophical theology in light of the themes of the conference. I need to say right off from the bat that I am not, necess uh, in a technical sense, a philosophical theologian. Uh, philosophy is not one of my major disciplines. However, um, it is a, an allied discipline for me. And to the extent that I will be interacting with philosophy in this particular conversation, the way I'd like to approach that is by an exploration on theological method. So in, in some ways, a philosophy of doing theology itself uh, and what that, um, how we might think about that in light of the current, in the current situation. Um, and I'm not going to be doing that in any kind of a general way. I'm not going to be offering a method for doing theology during a pandemic. But talking about the method of doing theology, as I understand it, at all, and how that is different or the same under the conditions of pandemic in which we find ourselves. And I'm going to provide an example of uh, why I think the, the um, getting the method right is so important uh, and how the, the pandemic has uh, presented us with that case study. So my context for doing theology at all and the way that I teach and produce theology is from a seminary context. So I, I don't want to overdraw here any distinction between academic theology on the one hand and pastoral theology on the other. I certainly don't want to make almost any distinction between theology and practice or systematic theology and practical theology. I'm, I'm quite with Sarah Coakley on this, that these distinctions have not done us any favors disciplinarily, nor have they done us any favors ecclesially. So that's not what I'm about here. Um, instead, what I would like to do is, is talk about theology um, as a reflection on practice and theology as formational. And for me, what that means is doing theology in such a way that it's, it, it, that it's of course, formational in t to the extent that it is forming priests for the Episcopal Church here in the United States and elsewhere, um, and members of other uh, bodies who have elected to do seminary work at, here at CDSP, or take classes with us while they're at one of the other allied institutions. But when I'm talking about forma the formational edge of theology, what I'm really interested in talking about is making sure to keep in mind always that we're trying to produce a theology that is transformational rather than deformational. Anything that's formative, obviously, can be deformative. And I want to be very careful that the theology that we produce um, and that I teach my students to produce is one that is transformational of people's lives and their relational um, connections with God and others, themselves, the rest of the creation, rather than deformational of them. And that's a principle that guides the work that I do and that will guide these comments today. Um, I'm also uh, working from um, an understanding of theological imagination that is more than just uh, a, a, an envisioning process. It's imagination in the sense that Charles Taylor might use that term. Maybe I am more philosophical than I realized. Um, in the sense that it's an imagination of a world, of a complete world in which one um, lives and moves and has uh, a sense of meaning and place and purpose and um, has a, a sort of ease and facility in, in navigating. So a theological imagination that is robust in that way, that encapsulates both the conceptual and the practical um, in, such a, in such a way that it becomes an entire way of being. That's the kind of theological imagination that I'm talking about, something along the lines that 
um, the theologian Garrett Green might talk about, for example. Uh, and my, my understanding of this imagination is that the imagination that, that um, a theologian has of what she thinks that she is up to when she's doing the work of theology and what she's doing when she's a being a Christian, that imagination is, is both formative of a set of practices, but has itself been formed by a set of practices in this um, ongoing cyclical recursive process in which practices for, are, provide the basis for reflection on those practices, which provides um, additional insight that then is uh, uh, employed in the development and refinement of additional practices, whether these are personal or communal practices, and so forth. So there is a, 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 and of course, um, to the extent that there's a social and political in, engagement here, this is a, a, a pretty straight up praxeological um, process in the Marxian sense, um, in the liberation theology uh, vein. But it's, it's also um, simply what it looks like to have a religious imagination that um, the, uh, as an Anglican, the way we, uh, I'm very committed to the notion that the way we worship uh, affects very deeply the way that we um, characterize and, and um, identify who God is and who we are with relationship to God. And that that characterization, that understanding of God's identity then becomes formative and transformative for new ways of relating to God uh, in our practices. I'm very much, I, mean, I, I, I am proud to be, have been a, um, someone who learned under Elizabeth Johnson while I was a graduate student, and I take a very um, uh, dominant cue from her in my own work, the, where, where her, her, one of her famous lines, of course, being the symbol of God functions, and I'm not doing her a disservice by, by um, by, by uh, elaborating further on that to say the sim every theological symbol that we use functions. And I'm going to be making a lot of that in this, in this presentation. Um, I believe very similarly with Robin Williams that the way that we do, or the reason why we theologize, we theologize principally to make meaning that it's a meaning-making enterprise to articulate theology. It, it, it goes beyond um, simply discerning the proper ways to speak of God, uh, which is an important task in theology, of course, but it also is a way in which we find our place in the world, we find our place in relationship to God and others, and we are able to discern our commitments as disciples of Christ. What is it that we are staking our lives on? What is it, you know, here we're follow, I'm following Kierkegaard, right, in some ways, what, what is it that I'm going to um, take as true such that I'm willing to make that leap of faith in order to uh, pursue it. Again, th this is also another core concept that I'm going to be talking talking about, or it's going to be in the background uh, quite substantially as I talk today. So if theology is the project of making meaning within the Christian horizon, uh, what that means then is that it's interpretive. It's interpretive to the extent that it is a way of, of being in the world such that um, the, the resources of Christian tradition and, above all, uh, its narratives in the scriptures and its, its um, genius in, as reflected and recorded in our scriptures allows us to interpret our lives, allows us to interpret the world, allows us to find meaning in uh, the reality where we are, 
this is no small task. It's a gigantic and important vocation, meaning making in the Christian in a Christian vein. And to that extent, then, it is deeply about discernment. It is the question, how then shall I live? Yes, but it, it, it's not so on grounds other than how then shall I live in light of who God is and in light of who I am as a creature of, who, of that God. That's the kind of theological imagination that I am talking about and the commitments to which that gives rise. So, in my work in the seminary, what my goal here is, uh, my goal here is not to produce theologians for the academy. If some of the people that I train end up pursuing an academic path, I'm all for that and, and certainly help them along the way. But as people who are training far and away in the majority to be priests or other kinds of leaders within the church. What I am trying to do is introduce students to the current, to the major um, figures and questions and themes in the Christian tradition across space and time that they are able to engage with that in such a way in both general terms and in Anglican terms that they have an adequate disciplinary introduction to Christian theology. That's important in the two-semester sequence that I, um, that I provide for them. And I think it's also important, and maybe even more important in some ways, because I'm not training academic theologians, again, not that I'm trying to overdraw this distinction, but because I'm not preparing theologians for the academy, but for the church, maybe is a better way of saying it, I want them to understand why doing theology matters. Why it matters that we think theologically in ways that are precise and coherent and well-reasoned. Too often, I think, our students come into the seminary thinking that theology is an intimidating course and one that... Um, is kind of, I, I joke that, that they, there, there seems to be this understanding that theology is the kind of calculus of the seminary program, that you, you have to take it, it's an advanced subject, very few will find use in it, and you must pass it in order to get the degree so that you can do what you really want to do. Um, and I try to help them understand right away that it, it, it theology, systematic theology, is not something that we learn over against the arts of the min of ministry, but that it's deeply ingredient to ministry precisely because of theological imagination. That is what gives you your sense of commitment to what it is that you're doing whenever you're doing. And that's not always evident to students. They are thereby helped to understand that Theology is that which reflects on and enables healthier relationships between themselves and God with themselves, their own, their own internal relationships, with themselves and other people, and with themselves and the rest of creation. This communion that takes place between um, all segments and components of God's creation and also with God. And this is a critical piece of work because at the end of the day, what I think is most important for them to understand as theologians coming into their own voice is that there is such a thing as theological malpractice and that good theology gives life and that bad theology kills. Again, this is not something that they're often aware of and, 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 and they're not aware, therefore, of the stakes of theologizing. And, and it's precisely for that reason that I've just belabored this point. Because what, I'm try, what I try to do and how I think about theology is that the stakes couldn't be higher. We're handling matters of life and death. 
all the time, whether we realize it or not, and whether we pay attention adequately to that or not is another question. But that we are so doing is unde is, is actually undeniable and baked into the discipline. If, if Rowan Williams is right that theology is a way of making meaning in Christianly, given that life and death are um, two of the largest um, vectors for identifying what matters and what does not matter, or for occasioning us to think about those questions, then it must be true that what, and if Augustine is right, about the orientation of our uh, inner dispositions, then it must be true that when we are acting as Christians, we are oriented either to life or to death, toward that which, uh, flor to, uh, pro that which gives rise to flourishing or that which inhibits it. And that's what's at stake in doing theology. And this is what brings me to the question for today. What is different about doing theology, do the doing of theology under the condition of pandemic? And my answer is nothing. It's precisely nothing. Nothing is different. And it's because of those stakes. It's because the stakes are no higher. The life and death stakes that are facing us under COVID are no different than the life and death stakes that we handle every day as theologians and, and as we try to help our students understand that they are not dealing with insignificant matters here. They're, they're dealing with matters of the, the greatest possible meaning and commitment and risk and vulnerability that they could. Um, so there's nothing different. So what do I mean by that? I'm not just being cheeky. It's certainly true that emergencies can wake theologians up to the stakes involved in doing theology. I'm thinking here of someone like James Cohn, for whom the, um, the social upheaval of the, 19, of the early, well, throughout the decade of the 1960s, leading up to him writing Black Theology and Black Power and A Black Theology of Liberation, that work was occasioned by him realizing that the theological training that he was provided seemed too disengaged from the realities that he was facing as an African-American man in um, the United States at that time. And it had to be handling the, that if theology was going to be legitimately itself, his theology was going to be legitimately itself. And then he later came to see at any theology is going to be legitimately itself. It needs to always be about matters of ultimate import. So they can, emergencies can occasion theologians to discern this. And so Cohn, Gutierrez, and the other Latin American liberation theologians also um, came to that same realization in times of crisis. Uh, feminist theologians have understood the need to articulate the value of the, 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 the created value of being woman in God's creation um, in light of the inability of women to flourish as they ought to be given certain social situations and so forth. Um, I think of theologians who work on the environment and how some of those theologians uh, came to that work because they were awakened to the pressing urgency of needing to do that work. LGBT theologians, queer, th and, then, and then queer theologians doing it somewhat differently with a, a different set of, um, a different yet overlapping set of concerns. On and on and on. Now these, these trajectories were all kind of conversions that were precipitated by emergency situations, you might say, something like COVID, something like a, an exigency that is lighting a fire under theologians for particular reasons. But one of the things that they all come to see in the end is theology ought to have been pitched at that height all along. That, it, 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 that um, a theology 
that is engaged in, uh, I'm going to try to choose my words very carefully, um, a theology that is not engaged in questions of ultimate import is less than it could be. And so my view is, why don't we learn, we ought to learn from those insights and therefore be aware that theology at its most meaningful, or, or, or let me back, to, let me rewind. Theology is most meaningful and most itself when it is aware of the stakes of the game it is playing. And so um, that's what I mean by saying that nothing should be different. If we're doing theology with an awareness that the stakes are always high, when we speak, uh, and, and they always are, given our task and topic, speaking about God from a finite human standpoint and about the mysteries of the things of God from this limited perspective and committing ourselves to such perspectives, knowing that they are almost by definition bound to be erroneous. The risk involved in that, not to, to, our, to our own integrity, but not to mention to those who hear us and take these teachings or our perspectives to be in some way authoritative and then act on them, it, it makes the admonition in the in the in, in the letter to James, the letter of James, that teachers are the most severely to be condemned, a little bit more pressing. So it is um, always a high stake endeavor, always a high stake endeavor. So. Um, now then what should the so, so so am i saying that theology should simply be about these matters of extreme existential import and not about anything more um uh, more secondary seeming um i'm not no i'm not i'm not i don't want to be misunderstood as saying that theology is only best when it's pursued in a um non ranarian way um, that doesn't start from existential questions and so forth, um, or, or that it is only, I'm sorry, um, uh, understood to be legitimate when it's this in this existentialist mode. That would be awfully reductive. I'm, I don't mean that. Um, and it shouldn't be reduced to a, a sort of Tolikian um, uh, cor correlation either, so that the, that the um, the state of the world as we see it, say the pandemic in this case, sets the agenda for how we theologize and what we know to be true about God as if there were no um, transcendent grounds for uh, re making meaning in the imminent realm in which we find ourselves living. That's not what I'm saying either. Nor, on the other hand, is, am I saying that it's necessarily Bartian that only the transcendent gets to condition what we say and how we say it within the, the world in which we live, though I would say I'm a little bit more closer to that pole than the other, than to the Tolikian. Um, theology is not an instrument in that way. It's not reducible to being some kind of spiritual technology or system in the reductive, narrow, scientific sense that gives us some kind of... Uh, slate of propositions by which we can organize our lives and so forth that nor should it be that's not the that's not theology's role rather a theology that is about developing an imagination of of um, of meaning a universe of meaning about god and our own and the significance of our lives and the lives of the, of, of all that is um, is is multi-dimensional it's dynamic it's ever-changing. It is relational and worshipful, so that it's about how we connect to God, other self, world, and it is um, done in that in the um, context of being a disciple, being one who prays, being one who worships, being one who engages in the rites and ceremonies of the church, um, etc. Um, again, as an Anglican, I believe uh, I'm. I'm uh, 
deeply influenced by the notion that the way we pray uh, shapes the way we talk about the meaning of, 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 of creation and our place in it. So that is um, that imagination is a is a worshipfully shaped one. And this is going to be important um, in a moment. Um, so this this imagination of what our life with God in Christ through the Spirit is and means is an imagination that shapes our practices of discipleship and is shaped in turn by those same practices, by our engagement, by our relationships. So it's dynamic. It's always ongoing. And my goal is to provide um, the tools that people require, whether they will become priests or other kinds of leaders or simply um, are people interested in taking their own discipleship to a new level, the tools that they need in order to engage in that work by deepening their theological imagination. To do that, they always need to know that theology is handling the things of life and death. The Anglican 17th century divine um, um, Jeremy Taylor writing on the art of living and the art of dying um, helps a, is, is a classic example of how um, discipleship in the world is always an art of, of life and an art of dying well. Um, and that's essentially what we are as disciples, those who are living unto God and those who are dying unto God and neighbor. And so those are the stakes. Now, what this means is all theology is either helping discipleship to grow and deepen, or it isn't. And again, I don't want it to sound like that means there's no such thing as, as, as sort of the, the, the academic vein of theology that might sort of um, be interested in questions that might seem like theological minutiae or sub sub uh, secondary or maybe even tertiary matters. Let's take an example. So, be like Catherine Sonderager. Um, if you look at her work, this is a person who um, is able to examine, uh, speaking of someone who does theology philosophically, is able to examine deep questions um, and, and very, I'm sorry, able to examine small, detailed, precise questions in a deep way. Um, that don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily first and foremost about how we live as Christian disciples, but because the mode in which she does that theology and the aim of the theologizing itself that she engages in is solely about deepening a relationship with and a passion for the living God, that is her ultimate concern, even when it's not her proximate one. And that is deeply what I have in mind when we're talking about this. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to say that everything that we, um, uh, that the only legitimate theology is the theology that immediately admits of some kind of practical application. First, I, I think that's, um, uh, that is uh, deeply uncreative, and um, and uh, there is a place for speculation and contemplation in the Christian theological tradition that can't be gainsaid, and it needs to be referred always. That that speculation and uh, contemplation needs to always be referred back in some way, at some level, uh, at some moment in the process to then, how does this affect my life? and my relationship with God. So it's not an either-or proposition. It's a, it's a both-and proposition. And this has direct bearing on, on, the, on, on doing theology under the conditions of COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm leading up to that. So a good critical theology always simultaneously analyzes, expresses, and provides a coherent and compelling rationale for its commitments. That's what it means to theologize, right? That's part of the meaning-making enterprise that theology is. If this is how such a theology is proceeding, 
emergencies then won't occasion some kind of revision in the method. It'll, the, the, the method will obtain regardless of the context in which the theology is taking place. Obviously, the content could shift because the questions, the, the specific questions that are occasioning the theological exploration have shifted. But the way we're doing the theology that we do ought not to have been shifted. And, and moreover, my contention is that if we keep theology pitched high, if we keep in mind that what we are always doing is handling matters of the extremist import, matters of life and death, matters that um, kill or give life, and that this is for the upbuilding of disciples engaged in ongoing processes of discernment, then what happens in a, pro in a situation of anxiety is that better theological discern discernment can happen than when, that is, than, than when the pitch is lost sight of. When we think that theology is about matters less than matters of life and death, and something less than um, how we live within the Christian horizon daily. And that that's of ultimate import. That's of eternal significance. If we lose sight of that, then when something, emer when something happens like COVID, people begin to feel that they're out of their depth and they begin to make rush judgments about what... Um, uh, is an appropriate response to the circumstance, forgetting commitments and meaning and what we've staked our faith on. So let me give an example of this, how this plays out, how this can play out, um, one that I've seen in these COVID times, and that is in the area of thinking about how to worship online. Um, so the context here is that... Uh, in the, in, the, in the years and the decades after the liturgical renewal of the 20th century, Anglicans have been deeply impacted by weekly round of Eucharistic worship, and they feel, the, and we feel the loss of it um, deeply, and the prospect of losing it when COVID first began and the pandemic was necessitating the closure of um, churches and the the prohibition of large gatherings and so forth uh, was to react. There was a reaction that took place. And in some instances, um, there was a celebration of Eucharist that was taking place virtually. And where it wasn't taking place virtually, there were also calls for it to take place virtually. And a, and a robust conversation has been had in a variety of spaces through a variety of different means about the advisability of doing that or not. And my argument is that, be, that to the extent that we have in some ways forgotten that theology is always confronting the extremist circumstances, people rushed to make, to, to make um, pronouncements about how we can and should go forward for getting core, certain core commitments. Let me explain what I mean. Some of the arguments, and, uh, and not all, I'm going to just review three arguments for doing online communion. And, and, I, and I want to say right off the bat, I am bracketing out everything except Eucharist. And the reason is because online worship, in my view, in that respect, is no different um, than a, a radio broadcast of certain forms of worship. To hear the word proclaimed and preached, to sing, to get to, to, um, uh, to hear... Uh, announcements from the community to share in celebrations and and in, and intercess for one another and for the world. Quite appropriate online. Quite appropriate online. It's Eucharist. Eucharist is the thing that I'm um, questioning for on theological grounds. So what are they? Well, let me first review uh, uh, to, to draw that out. Let me um, 
present three um, arguments that are commonly made to support the idea of doing Eucharist online. Um, and uh, I will review two of them very briefly and one of them more at length because I think it's the most um, uh, pressing. The first is that Christian worship requires it. Um, there's an argument made that uh, because the liturgical renewal has showed us how invaluable uh, weekly Eucharist is, that it must happen. And of course, it, that's not so. Uh, it's only in the last 50 years that we've had um, weekly celebrations of the Eucharist in, in Episcopalian contexts. And so um, it's clearly not needed for all forms of legitimate worship. And the Anglican tradition in our, in, in our current temporary books of common prayer as well, signals that Sunday morning worship can consist of what we call the daily office, morning prayer, a, a version of morning prayer, which does not include a Eucharistic rite. So it's not required for legitimate um, Sabbath worship. A second argument is that God can show up anywhere, so why can't God show up in the Eucharist online? My argument here is that God showing up or not is not what's at stake. See, again, with stakes. God showing up or not in the action is not what's at stake. We never make God show up or not in our worship. That's not the point of worship. The point of worship is not to make God show up. God is already present. God does not need to be coerced into showing up. God can, sh can and, and in fact promises to show up everywhere and every when. So this is a, a, a theological question about what is sacrament for? Is it to make God show up? No, it's not about making God show up. Just consult the Psalms. God is, God is everywhere you can conceive of being plus more. Um, there's no way that our worship makes God show up. Also, it makes it seem as if God needs Eucharist in order to be worshipped properly. And, and that's not at all true. God does not need worship in order to be God. God does not need worship Eucharistic worship in order to be God. God doesn't need anything in order to be God. So why do we do it in the first place? Again, what's at stake here? If we worship or we do not worship, generally, and if we do Eucharist or do not do Eucharist, generally, what is at stake? Nothing is at stake for God. It's all at stake for us. So the question about where God shows up and whether God requires this of us is the wrong question because it mistakes what the Eucharist is for, what worship is for, who worship is for. Worship is rightly aimed at God, but that's because it is our responsibility as God's creatures to magnify and glorify our creator. But that's for our own benefit, not for God's. That's, that's the crucial thing that these arguments seem to forget. And I would argue that's because they have forgotten what is at stake in them. These are meaningful, formative rituals of worship in which we engage for our formation, upbuilding, and the, the strengthening of our relational capacity with, our, with God, with one another, with ourselves, and with the rest of God's creation. That's what Eucharist is for. Now, and, and, you know, one might say, well, isn't that what's true of all worship? It is. It is. So then what makes this particularly different? That is not... Um, if, if, if you, Scott McDougall, have already said that you are supportive of the proclamation of the word, for example, or the liturgy of the word, in um, online, then why not this if they have the same purpose? Because there's a second, there, there's a third argument here that, that answers that, that I want to review, which is that Eucharist is a spiritual practice and the spirit can work virtually. So why can't Eucharist be done online? 
And th that seems like a, a perfectly fine argument, except it's really the most damaging argument, in my view, of them all, because it mistakes what the nature and purpose of Eucharist specifically is. Eucharistic worship, not worship in general, Eucharistic worship. Worship is for us, remember? It's for our upbuilding, it's for our benefit. What is it that is at stake in our Eucharistic worship? If we say that worship can be done only with, um, that, the, that the worship, that Eucharistic worship is a spiritual matter and does not require our physical presence, what we're saying, what we're doing is supporting a, a, a dualism in God's creation between spirit and matter. Spirit and, and, human, and humanly, it's a dualism between spirit and body. One that has not served us well, it leads to denigration of the body, it leads to deformed understandings of sexuality, it leads to deformed understandings of sin and sinfulness, it leads to environmental rapaciousness. There's a whole variety of things that it leads to that we don't have time for here. But suffice it to say, there is um, no good reason for us to do anything that would reinforce a pre-existent cultural bias that we've already got, that the spirit is better than the material. And that we are really just spirits inhabiting meat envelopes temporarily until we go off to be with God in some other realm that's better than this one. So we do not want to re do anything that reinforces this privileging of the spirit over the flesh. The flesh is important, and the flesh does not get transmitted to each into each other's presence by Zoom. What this does is dematerialize the bodies of ourselves and the bodies of others, and we already have a problem with the dematerialization of other people's bodies. Moreover, that the materialization, the proper materialization of the bodies of self and other is precisely what we're doing when we gather for Eucharist. We're eating the body that we are in order to be who we were meant to be, which is the united body of Christ. We can't do that at a, at a remove. Eucharist w online would erase the ability for physical proximity. It, would er it erases the ability for there to be touch, the touch of the priest to the cut to the elements, which, trans which is um, a earth touching earth as an offering back from God's creation to God uh, in the elements, and then the breaking and distributing body to body to body, being able to pass the peace and touching one another as we so do, by either shaking a hand or hugging or kissing one another, taking the elements and ingesting them from one person's hands into another person's hands, from the hands of those who made them, on and on and on, just the touch involved. It's all gone. It all goes away. Why does this matter? Because the Eucharist is a practice. It's a discipline. It's a performance of the new kind of relational reality that Jesus Christ came preaching called the kingdom of God. A revision of the way we are in the world so that we can be in the world in a different way. A way that involves our bodies, all of us, not just parts of us, some spirit that's actually a Cartesian mistake, not truth. The boxes that we become in Zoom, online, only reinforce this atomization. They don't overcome it the way that Eucharist logic is meant to do. They reinforce it. They reinforce our cultural understanding that we're autonomous. We are individuals. Moreover, ingesting Eucharist, I use that word purposefully, online by our eyes is yet another way to consume, again purposeful, Eucharist as a consumer commodity that we stream like anything else on Netflix. And that's not what Eucharist is. Eucharist is a ritual action in which we stand shoulder to shoulder across difference, becoming a single body and putting our bodies together with the bodies of others, absorbing the bodies of those who can't 
make the ascent, for example, infants, those in the state in the last stages of dementia, those who are otherwise um, differently abled, those in deep depression who simply have no power other than to show up and be embraced by the community, be among the gathered. We become one in those situations at our level of possibility for becoming part of the body of Christ. That's impossible when we don't have physical proximity to one another. But Paul says it's ingredient to the logic of the right when he talks in 1 Corinthians about the proper way of celebrating. We're making no distinctions among you so that you can together be the body as one. The body matters. Solidarity matters. Standing together in our difference, not being absorbed into one another, but our difference almost as if we had been salted, being even more flavorful because of our unity as the one body eating the one loaf, drinking from the one cup. That's not possible at a remove. We all know there is a qualitative difference between gathering in person and gathering online. We just do. We know that. Any of us who have taught online know this. because And, and the studies have borne this out. It's exhausting to teach online because you don't have the same kinds of cues that you have when you are in when you are person to person, even with a close up on somebody's face, because um, so cognitively we experience another person differently when they are present versus when they are mediated to us through a screen. That difference matters. The non material of them, mater the non materiality of them matters. And for, for the logic of this rite called Eucharist, it's at stake there. It's, it, is, it is of the utmost importance that Eucharist is a practice of a new way of being gathered together, body to body, a new way of transforming our bodiliness, a new way of transforming our relationships of bodies to one another and to the world and before God. So because presence is core to the logic of the right and what it means to us, how it forms us, and who it makes us into. It's a communication of grace, yes, and that doesn't need a material reality to transmit it, though the symbols of the transmission of grace in the sacraments are signally important. But it's a communication in the, in the sense of communication technology. It's information. To be involved in the Eucharist is to be informed, in hyphen formed, not only with data, as it were, but to be shaped from within by our bodily presence one to the other, to be have our relational dispositions to ourselves, to God, to other people, to the rest of creation changed because of our physical proximity. Through our physical proximity, not in spite of, because of our physical proximity. As I said, disability, pain, anguish, depression, infancy, um, seniority, all of these conditions that disallow any kind of engagement that we might be able to engage in when we can speak and see, which is what's required for being online, in that set to, 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 um, to do it fully in that way, is, is overcome when you are able to physically be in the same space and do the same thing together in the same orientation, shoulder to shoulder, body to body, becoming one body in that way. So what, what I think the argument for the arguments, where I think the arguments for doing, unless there are better arguments, which I'm always up, up for hearing, but in terms of the commitments that I hold as a theologian, I can't see how doing communion online doesn't run afoul of the premium that we must place on solidarity in the Eucharistic act and putting our presenting our bodies as a reasonable sacrifice and fitting sacrifice in the book of in the language of the book of common prayer before God to be transformed for the good of the world. <laughs> 
together with our fellows in a community that sometimes pisses us off, and yet we're still in relationship with them, which is different than the world's way of doing things, right? So it's a, it's, there's a transformed relationality that's taking place there. So my point in all of this is being clear from the start about what theology is and what it does, and at the height of the stakes at, what it's, at, at which it works, keeps theology true to its vocation. A vocation, as I see it, that is to guide discernment as we go about making meaning and deepening relationship with God, with one another, to ourselves, with the rest of creation, regardless of the circumstances. So the method doesn't change regardless of pandemic, regardless of climate change, regardless of war, regardless of tyranny, regardless of civil unrest. The method doesn't change if we're true to our commitments and we're true to the vocation of theology, which is to treat matters of life and death every moment we're doing the work of theology as if the very existence of the world depended on it because that that in, in some ways is the is is the level we're working at without a tight on a tight rope without a net except by faith we can be confident that we will um that our work will be saved even if through fire <laughs> but we will come through um because of um we, because we're doing that as, as the vocation of a theologian and of disciples of Christ. Thanks for your time and attention, and I hope this has been useful to you in some way.